All right, I found my board here at Studio B, and I got my vault black cherry. No caffeine, no sugar, plenty of Tito's. <laughs> That's right, I'm, and I'm one behind the staff. Anyway, today we're talking about the headlines. The headlines, Universal Music, TikTok, Taylor Swift, Drake, all these headlines this week. And people were asking me, hey, what's up with Universal? I don't understand royalties. I don't understand what's going on. Can you explain this to me? And I said, you know what? Universal music is something that could use some explaining itself because it is a long story that I'm going to make into a short case study so you can see what a roll-up looks like. So we're going to talk about roll-ups and consolidations. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. We're going to show you where this one came from. So first of all, what's up? Headlines. Universal Music Room yanks its artists, including Taylor Swift, off TikTok. What to do. So in other words, how do you put music in TikTok because you're doing videos and things like that, and all of a sudden it's off there. It has to do with licensing. Those, those videos and the music tracks are not free on TikTok. TikTok has to have music rights agreements with anybody. The same way on Instagram, you put up a post and something, and you select some of those uh, uh, musical backdrops and, and backtracks that you want. Licensing makes it way to a record label, makes it way to an artist, or for the art artists who are dead, which is most musicians over the age of 50, you have a situation where it makes it way to their estate. Then, you know, his song was going massively viral. Hours later, Universal Music and TikTok went to war. Rolling Stone talking about some poor up and coming artist that ends up in the mix. Finally, New York Times, Universal Music Group pulls songs from TikTok. So in other words, this wasn't just small things. This is the New York Times, Rolling Stone. This was a real war really happening. So what happened? TikTok and Instagram and any other social media that wants to provide options for you to enhance your posts in the form of music have to have a standing agreement in place so that any song, artist, track, melody, anything that makes its way back to an artist who did that under copyright, that has to be paid to them. How? Through roughly a 264 page contract, just my estimate, between Universal Music or Warner Music or Sony Music or whomever and TikTok or Instagram, Meta or whomever has to be in place. Well, apparently, there was a renegotiation going on and TikTok is growing like this. So the music industry is like, hey, you're growing fast. You must be making money. We want a fair shake. We know what a fair shake looks like or we want more. It's a renewal. And all of a sudden it breaks down. So Universal says, we are the big dog here. We got Drake. We got The Weeknd. We got Taylor Swift. And now you TikTok have none of it. We're off. And so they come to a conclusion here where there's now a gap. There's no contract. So within this gap, all the stuff has to come down. This is called leverage on a part of the music label because the artists are in favor of it. The artists don't want Universal just to finally, oh, okay, well, it's TikTok and it's, you know, <clears throat> billion views every day and all this stuff. No, the artists want, the artists want their money. Count the money. They want it. So that's what's going on. But how did Universal get so much power? Let's go back in history and find out where it comes from. Way back, 1962 and before, there was, and by the way, this is 60 years ago. You know, there was MCA merges with DECA records. MCA and DECA, way back in the day. And you can find some really old signs and stuff in um, Nashville. If you go down Broadway in downtown Nashville, you'll find neon signs in a couple of the, of the bars there where you have live music and you'll see DECA. That's because DECA goes way back. It's like the history of music. It's like a, looking at an antique sign for Mercedes or Ford someplace. That's what it's all about and that's what this is. So MCA merges with DECA in 1962. We'll fast forward, you know, a, Okay, almost 30 years, and we'll get to Matsushita Electric in Japan. An electric company buys MCA for $6.59 billion. Now, the only people who were happy was the owners here, because musicians were like, why is a freaking electric company in Japan buying this giant recording company? Well, it would get, it would get fixed. Five years later, Matsushita says, uh, why do we own this thing? Let's sell 80% of it. So Seagram acquires 80% of MCA in 1995. Then part of that got renamed Universal Studios. Part got renamed Universal Music Group or UMG. Ta-da, you see where this is going? 
it got renamed. Then in 1998, Seagram buys Polygram. Remember that? There's Polygram. Now people in our generation remember seeing that logo on the back of CDs, back when CDs existed and stuff, and they merge it with it. So you see, all the artists contained in here are now part of UMG. So phase one. Now we go to phase two. Consolidation heats up. Vivendi, French company, buys Seagram for $34 billion. Now Vivendi has all that. Meanwhile, Universal Studios and the movie side is sold to NBC, and that now becomes NBC Universal. Meanwhile, Universal Music Group is owned by Vivendi. Then Vivendi goes out and buys the last 20% of UMG from Master Shista. You know, Remember, they only bought 80% the first time. Now they went and got it. Now they own the whole thing. Then Vivendi bought BMG for 2.4 billion, BMG Music. Then they go out and make a deal in 2008 with this little tiny startup with a little green logo called Spotify. They made a deal streaming on Spotify. Remember that? And I don't know, remember whether Pandora was there at that time, but the whole world was upset from, nine, from 2005, six, I think, was Napster. Remember Napster? People were downloading for free in the music industries. What the hell's happening? People are taking their CDs and, and digitizing them and putting them on Napster. A lot of that stuff was going on. Napster ends up in front of the uh, Congress on a hearing, a lot of things happening. But now we have streaming where you get paid for it, and the music industry was now calming down, wanting to protect CD sales and protect what was left of vinyl sales, and they went ahead and did a deal with Spotify. <laughs> then EMI was sold to UMG. Now, you're thinking, who's left? Well, you still have Warner and Sony, and we'll get to that in a minute. But now, there you go. The giant is created. And the, there we go. Then Vivendi bought Seagram, and then 2019, Tencent purchased 10%. Later, this would become 20%. So Tencent, those guys, now own 20% of you know, UMG. Then, brand new Spotify deal, they renew it. This is 12 years later, they renew it. Followed by Pershing Square. Pershing Square, Bill Ackman, the guy that's out there, that guy, he purchased 10%. So suddenly now, this is big time players because Tencent owns 20, Pershing Square owns 10, 30% is owned by some major power players that are in entertainment and private equity. Well, they then, what do you do then? You take it public on the stock exchange, a bunch of happy guys, and Euronext where they don't ring the bell, they bang the gong, and there's an old song somewhere out there like that, bang a gong. What happens next? Well, Universal Music is now 55 billion in an electric stock market debut. That should have said musical stock market debut, but whatever. However, you can see over time, it goes out right here. And this is going back September of 2021 um, is when this went out. So we're coming up on three years this fall. And you can see it just kind of meandered along and we are only just now, I'll go off to the other part and I'll practically disappear from the picture here, back to where we started, see that? So, and we have this right here, known as the post-COVID Taylor Swift extravaganza, where she's just, all she does is make hit music. So now you can see, now they're on the stock market, but they're not taking off and going out of sight. This isn't like Elon Musk's rocket to Mars or anything. It's just kind of a meandering stock for the last two and a half years. Hence, when it's time to renegotiate a streaming contract with someone like TikTok, what do you do? You get the best deal you can because you also want to drive your stock price and the artists want their share of the pie. Bingo. So now you can see what happened. So how big did UMG become? So now you understand, UMG wants the best deal for all those artists, and they are a heavyweight. How do you know? Digital and physical revenue market share, okay? So in other words, percent of the largest recording companies worldwide. Universal controls 32% of it. Warner Music Group, less than half that. Sony, 
only 66% of that side, and then all the Indies is everywhere else. Look at that. They are one third of the market by themselves. So now let's take a look, and we pulled some data from Spotify. I think you'll find this pretty interesting. If you were to look at the top 10 artists by monthly listeners, this isn't the total streams. Total streams is Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift. That's total streams. If you look at total independent listeners for the month of January, believe it or not, The Weeknd had 116 million unique listeners. Taylor Swift, 102, Drake, 85. All the ones in black here is Universal Music. These two, Ed Sheeran and Dua Lipa, down there, blue. Sony's not even on the, on the list. And none of the indies have bro bro broke in. Understand, all the ones that are black there is universal out of this. So not only are they 32% of the market, they're the best 32% of the market. They're not just 32% of the market. They are the highest grossing, biggest. I mean, look at that. Drake, Taylor, and The Weeknd over the last three. And look, Bieber. My goodness, Bad Bunny. Look at that. So that tells you just how powerful. Now, again, before you write in the comments, Taylor Swift's been number one. She's been Billboard number one for like 300 weeks or something. No, this is just from Spotify, and this is just the month of January unique listeners, right? If you were to do this by streams, Taylor Swift is 30% bigger than number two just streams because when your daughter listens to one of those Taylor Swift songs off the era's tour guess what she listens to it five times that's five streams you know she just sits there and repeat and memorizing it that's five streams or ten but there you have it now you can see just how big Universal is so when why is this important Warner and Sony were performing a strategy known as silent follower in other words, if Universal squeezes TikTok and gets a better contract, guess what? Warner and Sony just say, I want what they got. Because even though this is the top ones, Warner can back out and say, okay, well then we're gonna take those off. And TikTok doesn't want that. TikTok's gonna want the samplings of everything that's hot behind there because that's what people wanna to listen to and that's what they're inventing and building the, all those shorts on TikTok. So, Warner and Sony just have to sit by and kind of wait. It's like it doesn't matter whether you like soccer or basketball or baseball or football, you'll notice when a certain player gets a new all-time largest contract, the second, third, and fourth free agents just sit back and said, well, that sets the new price of the market. My statistics are 90% of what his were, so my contract, my agent's gonna push for 90% of what just he got, and he just got the super contract. So this is all the more important in a roll-up situation when you have the big dog is setting the terms for everybody else. Also known as, you know, when they make it rain money, it rains on us as well. And I don't mean rain in a bad sense. I, I mean rain money. Go make it rain in here. So that is where all these headlines were this week. It wasn't just about Taylor and TikTok. It wasn't just about Universal. It is all of music trying to get a better deal for artists everywhere when you get sampled, as it's called. And you can go back and look at the dawn of hip hop when all their sampling was going on. Um, you know, and there was, um, remember um, uh, MC Hammer, Can't Touch This? And the backtrack for that was a little sampling off a thing called Super Freak from like 1979, 1980 from a guy named Rick James. Nonetheless, Rick James may have been retired or back then, I guess he was in prison at the time, tends to happen. And, you know, but his people still wanted their part of, hey, what's going on with MC Hammerson? What, I, I don't understand this. So sampling was also part of this. So everywhere music shows up, everywhere there's a new frontier, whether it was the sampling and early hip hop and rap, or it's now social media using backtracks and using and to make tracks for things, everybody wants their piece of the pie. And this is the free agent contract of the century with Universal Music playing a game of chicken with TikTok. So now then, I thought it would be interesting to just add a little bonus. So here's a little bonus coverage. And so we'll make this a BizDoc short. Hey, do you know who the all-time streamed artists are as of February 2024? Check this out. Drake is the all-time most streamed artist with, ready for this, 140 billion, 840, 
45,235,713 streams all time. By the way, there are 8 billion people on Earth at this hour. This is 140 billion streams. So unless you believe in aliens that have come down or listening to music and checking out Drake, this is basically every person on Earth, if you were to average that, has listened to 20 Drake songs. Think about that. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Almost 20. And then, of course, Taylor Swift, and they say, you know, um, she's a good uh, 15 billion behind, so an hour and a half from now she passes Drake, the way things are going. And then Bad Bunny, The Weeknd, Ed, BTN, you can see. You can see it's the modern artists that have shown up. If the Beatles had been out today, they would be up here. But the modern artists where the youth is listening via streaming, take a look at that. And what I think is very interesting, in any 80-20 rule, I tend to look for the half point. So look at this. Half of 140 would be 70. Look at that. It's, and number 70 is number nine. So in other words, Drake has twice of the total streams over time that Justin Bieber does. Think about that. It's just, it's just crazy. It just shows you the intense popularity and how streaming is taking over. Anyway, I thought that'd be a little Easter egg here, a little treat for you, looking it up to find the grand total of all time. But it's pretty good. So I'd like to thank our good friends over at um, Spotify and um, uh, I think Billboard that had some of this data putting it all together. So, all-time streamed artists. So is streaming important? Yes. Are streaming contracts important? Yes. Getting your pennies every time someone puts your song on TikTok important? Hell yes. So now then, lessons for you and me. So you can see this story is really about a roll-up. They kept buying all the record labels, putting them all together until they became the gorilla. But remember, it's got to be the right record labels. And over time, apparently, they've got the right libraries when you take a look at who they've got and the modern artists that they signed, such as Drake and Taylor Swift. Now, why did Drake and Taylor Swift sign with them? Because they had all of them. They said, we have everybody. Look at the history. Look what we have in this library here. You're going to be part of that library forever. Why wouldn't you be with us? That's a hell of a sales pitch. And that's the one that Taylor and Drake and The Weeknd and Bieber and everybody went with. So for you and me, strategy roll-ups can work now let me explain you don't have to be a record label you could be a plumbing supply company you could be running any sort of small company you could be running a lawn service company why can roll-ups work if it's a similar product with a similar market so similar people you're selling to them in the same way and similar distribution you can create a roll-up so if there was someone across town let's say you have an auto detailing business and you hear across town that these two guys with an auto detailing business, that they've got a good list of customers, people they're regularly seeing, they got some um, office buildings they go to, do three or four cars twice a week. And, but you hear that one of those guys wants to go to college and his mom says, you're not going to detail cars your whole life. And you say to yourself, hey, maybe we go up and talk to them. And you find out that you could give them $10,000 for their complete list. And one guy goes to college, the other guy comes, works for you. And they're happy because they split five grand and five grand for their detailing business and you basically bought the customer list. That's called a roll up. So on a small scale, now you've got another guy and another truck on your roll on your auto detailing business. Similar products, similar market, similar distribution, meaning you can operate your business the same way, but they give you longer arms, like bigger territory, more customers. So it works. Roll ups work. However, you know, being ready is everything. You have to be running a great company with great discipline and doing a really good job and be ready for the roll up. Because if your own house isn't in order, buying somebody else is just, just madness. When not to do a roll up? When buying others doesn't solve your problems, right? So if you are an NBA player and you married one Kardashian and you divorced her because her family was a zoo, and then three episodes later, you're dating her sister and you're gonna get married, nothing's gonna be fixed. You're gonna be in the same zoo. And I hate, I'm not picking on the Kardashians, but the point is in life, sometimes you can do things the same way and you just put yourself in the same problem all over again. And that's definitely what happens here. So this, what you saw with universal music could be what happens to you. And what happens if you're lucky enough to be a large player in your town? Like maybe you suddenly have 
you know, 20% of the landscape business in your town. Well, guess what? You can dictate prices. Just like Universal Music, you can go out to John Deere and say, look, I need to buy 40 tractors. I'm the largest one here in Fort Lauderdale doing landscaping. All the gated communities is mine. I'm doing, I got 20% of the business. And when you go to John Deere, guess what? You can get a better price. That is exactly how a roll-up can work. And that's all that Universal is using. They're using the power of having the best acts to leverage TikTok to get the best rate. Now, what's coming for you and me is somehow TikTok has to pay for that. So you may see subscriptions coming around the corner. And you see that they, uh, you can pay for the check mark, I think, on Insta now. You can pay a couple bucks to Insta. So there's ways that they want to get a couple dollars for you. They can pay for all this stuff. So somewhere the price has to come out on the other end, uh, unless your just volume is going up to the point that advertisers are willing to pay and Coke and Pepsi and, and all fashion products and everything. And the Kardashians, Kylie's Cosmetics or whatever it is now, I guess she sold it or something. But all of that comes together too, to put money in the pocket of TikTok. And then a lot of that money's got to come out and go back to the music people. And the circle of life goes round and round. But nonetheless, what you saw Universal Music do, you could do, believe it or not, on a little small scale. I hope that's helpful to you, and I hope that was informative. Okay, so I'm gonna take my Balt and Tito's and I'm gonna head back to the studio to wrap up.